So we're going to do what I call theater. On my new novel, We'll Do Magic with Small Change. This is a song from the novel. materializing from mist, dust, and light. There was nowhere to go. Enemy soldiers rushed past our hiding place, bellowing bloodlust. Seeing an alien emerge into human form, Kehinde did not scream or slow her pace, but accepted the event, an impossible vision, a dream nightmare unfolding before her as truth. Her disciplined calm eased my transition. 
yet nothing prepares you for the first breath, for the peculiar array of new senses, or the weightiness of gravity. I was stunned by the magnetic field and the urgency of desire for food, for touch, for expression and connection. The first experiences are paradise. As I selfishly reveled in the miracles of this universe, in the delight of a new body, danger threatened at Kahinde's back, bayonets, bullets, and a hundred furious feet. She gulped the humid air and glared back and forth between me and the watery entrance. Her deep brown flesh was torn and bleeding as her heart flooded bulging muscles with iron-rich, oxygen-dense blood. An unconscious man was balanced on the fulcrum of her shoulder. He bled from too many wounds onto the knives, guns, water gourds, ammunition, bedroll, food, wooden stool, palm leaf umbrella, human skull, and medicine bags that hung from a belt at her waist. She settled the man against the damp earth. She kissed his eyes, stroked his hair, and murmured to him. Foreign projectiles lodged in his organs. He'd soon bleed himself away. Abandoning him would have improved her chances of survival. Yet she had no intention of doing this. Gehende's mm -hmm. spirit appealed to me at once. Mm -hmm. My earth body settled on a form close to hers. She aimed a rifle at me. Later I would learn she was a sharpshooter, Kabeto, an elephant hunter, a merciless killer of her enemies. In these first moments I understood the murderous device, yet felt certain she would not set its lethal projectiles in motion. Too noisy. Why give herself away to harm me, a naked being just coming to my senses? She could not fathom the risk I posed. Trusting me for the moment was reasonable. I pushed her weapon aside with my still spongy cheek and bent to the suffering man. Kehinde shifted the rifle toward the cave opening and held a knife at my writhing algae hair while I ministered to him. If I knew then what I know now, I might have been able to save him. Perhaps it was better for me that I was so ignorant of human beings. He might not have embraced the newly formed wanderer. Kehinde might not have become my guide, and lonely wanderers fade back into the spaces between things, or fracture incessantly into their next to nothing. Kehinde! The man groaned and reached for her. I covered his mouth quickly. Kehinde dripped fragrant, salty fluid onto my face, silently urging me to act, to aid the broken man. With minor core manipulations, I eased pain, calmed turmoil, and gave them a few moments to share. The man came swiftly to his senses and gripped her calf. She thrust the rifle into my hand. I grasped it clumsily and, and monitored the cave mouth, but I doubted my resolve and my accuracy. My bones were still gooey, my muscles rock hard. She crouched down to the dying man. They passed soft sounds between them, inhaling each other's breath. She never betrayed his last words to me, yet I am sure he exhorted her to leave, to let him die with the hope that at least she had a chance to live. She shook her head, resisting him. The people who carried her death in their minds raced again through the water outside of our cave. The man heard them and clutched a blade at her belt. Insistent, he ground his teeth and spit his words at her. A name I would later learn. The sound made my throat ache. Someone splashed close to the entrance. Gehinde's heart raced. The dying man nodded at me and closed his eyes. Gehinde sucked a ragged breath. Sansa, she said. Her hand shook as she forced her cutlass through his heart. He did not cry out. My own heart rattled in my chest. Kehinde pressed her lips on his as blood burbled to an end. She wiped the blade on the damp ground and threw a wad of cloth toward me. 
Words rain down a, a frothy hiss, barely audible, like steam bubbling through a hole. I understood nothing and waved the cloth at her stupidly. My new earth body was starving for language. I, I gorged on her sounds, gestures, smells. I lapped up the twists and turns of her nose and lips, swallowed the flashes of light and dark from her blinking eyes. Her expressions were tantalizing and rich, but sense would only come after more experiences. Abandoning me would have greatly improved her chances of survival. She had no intention of doing this either. I resolved to know her completely. Gehinde would be the still point of my wandering on this planet. Okay, so uh, the other main character in this novel is Cinnamon. And it's 1987 in Pittsburgh and she's almost 15. And she has what she calls story storms. Words take her over. She tells an EMT person, possibly alien, about her mother, Opal, who collapsed in a theater at Cinnamon's audition and had to be taken to the hospital. Cinnamon wants to get to the hospital to run in a chair. Cinnamon's tongue ached with the words flooding her mouth. Words were her shield. Maybe it wasn't life or death for Opal, like Seiku or Raven. Maybe Opal wasn't so sick that she couldn't get well. Still, my, my mom, my mom is a, is a trial lawyer, like Uncle Clarence, and she gets folks to, to, to trip up on their, their own lying selves. Her court is everyday life, like, 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 like before Christmas. The bus company threatened to fire her over some cheating passengers. A glam couple, sort of Bonnie and Clyde, they were, they were trying to write downtown flashing weak old transfers. Clyde claimed Opal shrieked death threats at them. And my, my mom hardly reads her voice. Never does. A two-pack-a-day smoker, no lung power to get loud with. They, they, they were screaming and scamming, but Opal Jones was in the wrong for not being nice. Bus company couldn't fire her, though, because she was a hero, too. I'm not exaggerating. I was there. I saw her. So, so after Bonnie and Clyde, this young guy, he, he jumps on my mom's bus with ten inches of knife, yelling, close the damn door! The knife was as long as his forearm, and that's 10 to 12 inches on most folks. Bulky dude, greasy orange hair, muscles like slabs of ham across his chest and, and back, and he, he had on nice clothes that they needed to wash, and he was almost cute, too, you know, kind of like Klaus, but anyhow, um, the crazy sucker, he waves the knife and folks his eyes if he doesn't say what he wants, doesn't say anything except close the damn door. Grown men cower in the back of the bus. And I, I, I'm sitting in the middle, coming back from my beautiful lingerette, riding around with Opal so she's off work. Supposedly doing homework. Um, um, lingerette's an R-rated movie from England, but nobody ever cards me and Shady's side. I mean, at first, I don't even notice the crazy guy carrying on. I'm just staring out dirty windows, replaying a scene from lingerette. Johnny and Omar, uh, uh, you know, doing the nasty <laughs> while, the, while the washing machines kind of slosh <laughs> dirt and rot and dirt. Like, you know, like Seku and Dr. Lexi having a good old time. But, uh oh. Cinnamon did not need to explain Seku and Lexi for this story. Well, anyhow, a freaked out computer scrambling for cover elbows me in the jaw. I'd have missed the whole night scene. Opal's forever saying, you all the time with your nose stuck in a book, daydreaming, lost in nothing. The world could end and you wouldn't even notice. It's true, too. Anyhow, my mom is up in this wannabe punk's face, not doing some angry black woman rant, just talking <laughs> quiet, motherly, logical. She can kill you with logic. <laughs> so, the guy has to step close to hear her raspy smoker's voice. Hey, Salto. He lowers the knife as she lectures him for trashing the schedule, scaring little kids, grannies, and grown business suits. <laughs> it's quiet on the bus. We all listen to her. You got us sprawled across two lanes holding up traffic. For what? So you can ruin your young life? Think about it carefully. What are you doing here? My mom shoves her last ten bucks in his pocket and fusses at him about all the beautiful time you have to wait paying for this stupid mistake. You know, the girl he loves with all his heart, down the tubes, along with the kids they have together, and, and, and the whole Jimmy Stewart wonderful life. Uh, but 
she is dead certain that good people are really counting on this guy to come through. And, and there's that mountain of opportunity he's going to find just one block over. She pats his cheek and says, it's a crime to waste hope or give up belief. I write that shit down. She never talks to me like that. <laughs> the guy's face breaks apart. His nose is a fire hydrant pouring snot. My mom can read anybody's mind, even them. You gotta watch things too loud around her. <laughs> so Opal ruffles his nasty hair and says, don't look at me like you're a big nothing. I believe in you too. <laughs> the guy just drops the knife at her feet and jumps off when she opens the door. Have a nice day, she says to him. And then, <laughs> everybody all right? These words are like a hoodoo spell, swallowing up tension. People clap and hoot and take their seats, and she hides ten inches of knife somewhere without anybody noticing, and just drives on. Unbelievable. I mean, I wouldn't even hardly believe it either, but I was there. So when we get home, I ask her, weren't you scared? How'd you do it? And she says, your grandfather taught me how to bring somebody back to their right mind. Aiden told me, don't be spitting in somebody's eye and pretend like you're washing it out. Opal never talks nice about my grandparents or my great aunt. Old timey, backward folks, so country, they make her itch. That's how she usually is. I should have gotten her to tell me more about Granddaddy Aiden. But see, my grandparents and my great aunt, they're coming. Because they always do, you know, when, when things get, get, get rough. Was this a lie she wanted to be true? Was she turning coincidence into magic? Aunt Iris promised! What if they didn't come? Could have been a kind of diss them after all. Why had she stopped believing in the elders that they were on her side? Well, anyhow, a, gu a, a girl on the bus snapped photos of Opal and then that kid with, with hair in his face and knife in his fist, living color proof. You know, I got it in my magic words journal. Even the bus company couldn't fire a hero. I mean, not with proof and witnesses over Bonnie and Clyde trying to do a getaway for free. I mean, please. Opal Jones stopped the guy from ruining his life and made up lost time without breaking the speed limit. Now, how does one fire a hero? <laughs> Ooh, mentioning Seku and Lexi getting it on like in lingerie was stupid, dangerous too. Maybe they could still persecute Lexi for doing a minor. Even after Seku was dead, Uncle Clarence and Cousin Carol would love nothing better than some faggot put away, some demon to blame for running the mouth like a racehorse again. Opal would be so mad talking to you. Might as well broadcast on the emergency network. <laughs> <laughs>